intermittently quitting out like that. All right. Good morning. Happy Sabbath, everyone. How is everyone today? Excellent. Barbara, myself, and, and Michelle will be teaching today. Um, she is here in spirit, not spiritualism spirit, but... <laughs> So before we begin, Barbara, who's the most important person we need? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. Could you open us in prayer? Yes. Our dear Father in heaven, Lord, we're so thankful for another Sabbath. Lord, we're thankful that you are with us today. We thank you for this, this group, this Sabbath school class, and we pray that your spirit will guide in everything that is said and done here today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. So we're going to actually take a look at... Sabbath, spiritualism exposed. And looking at this, we're going to read the memory verse at the very end. and all hopefully come together. Um, but first of all, um, what does that mean? What is spiritualism? Good question, huh? It's kind of been tossed around a lot. So spiritualism, the definition from Oxford Languages is a system of belief or religious practice based on supposed communication with the spirits of the dead, especially through mediums. Now you might say, well, what's a medium, right? Besides somebody who talks to the dead. Um, I love scripture. Scripture probably describes it best. So if we go to 1 Samuel 28, verses um, 3 through 25, but we're actually going to only focus on a smaller part of that. Um, so basically, 1 Samuel 28, 5 through 7, and 10 through 13. The Lord doesn't answer Saul, right? Before the Philistine battle, but I'll just read it. When Saul saw the camp of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him, either by dreams or by Urim or by prophets. You remember what the Urim was? Remember the priest had the breastplate with the Urim and the thumb? So you could ask a yes or no question of God. Um, so God's not answering in any way. Verse 7, Then Saul said to his servants, Seek for me a woman who is a medium, that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman who is a medium in, at Endor. Saul <coughs> vowed um, to her by the Lord. And I'm cutting to verse 10 here just to cut it down. So they're at the witch's house now, Saul, or the medium. Saul vowed to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, Bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. The king said to her, do not be afraid, but what do you see? And the woman said to Saul, I see a divine being coming up out of the earth. So a medium is a term for anyone who can communicate or interact with the dead. First of all, let me ask you, was that Samuel that she brought up? Right, God's pretty clear about that. So who was it then? Demons. An evil spirit, right? Or you could call it a demon or any, one of the fallen angels. <laughs> We'll put it that way. So, we know it wasn't Samuel. And just so we know, because spiritualism is an awful lot about basically speaking to the dead, right? What makes a soul? Biblically speaking, what makes a soul? And actually, Genesis 2-7 spells it out as clear as it can be. Would someone like to read it? Then the Lord God formed. Well, go ahead. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed, breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. And actually, the literal translation is living soul. So, what's the com what makes a soul? The breath of life in a body together. Not individually, but together, right? God's, so, God's CPR. Yes. <laughs> what did you say? God's God's CPR. CPR. <laughs> so, um, and that, that is the definition of a soul. It's not something that floats in the ether. 
that, that haunts people at night or moves around stuff in the middle of the night and go, oh, so-and-so died here and they couldn't leave, right? Eh, oh. That's wrong. Just completely wrong. So, um, but there's this myth, this perpetual myth that we are immor immortal. And it's based in the Greek a lot and things like that, but where did it originally begin? With who? Satan. Satan. Would someone like to read Genesis 3, verses 4 through 5? I can read. The okay. serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die, for God knows that in the day that you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So let me ask you this. Who's the only immortal being in the universe? God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And what does Satan say if she gets this knowledge she will be like? God. You too. You're not going to die. You're going to be immortal like God if you do this. Right? That, I think, is the first lie that was told on this earth. And has been perpetuating that myth ever since. So let's talk about spiritualism in more modern times. We saw the witch at Endor, right? We know it's been around probably since sin, quite honestly. Um, but when did it really take off for our recent times here? If we look, there's an order. In 1790, remember, if you go through the churches and all that, there's a time of just total absence of God, right? No God at all, the age of reason. And then there was the great beginning of the Second Great Awakening where people coming back to God in 1790. In 1830, the Mormon church started. In 1831, William Miller began to preach on the second coming in 1844. In 1844, the Baha'i faith started in Persia, or Iran today. In 1844, we also had the great disappointment in the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. And in 1848, you have the Fox sisters and the creation, or at least, of modern spiritualism, the modern version of this. <coughs> The spirit communication via raps, and it was either knocking on the walls, furniture, <laughs> or the floor, somewhere in there, right? And it did turn out to be a hoax later, but... So let me ask you, what prophecy refers to 1844? The 2300 days. Do you think Satan knew this? Oh, yeah. Do you think Satan's trying to dilute what God's trying to do and put a whole bunch of other stuff in there as well? Yes. And so, and you look at it, the Mormon church, William Miller, and the Seventh-day Adventists all started in the same area. And like the upper state New York, that kind of... And Charles Darwinism was at the same time. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Thank Darwinism. you. Yeah. Yes, and so Satan is actively working to counter anything God is doing by giving you something false to believe in. So... Um, and he loves to counterfeit. So although spiritualism has been around for so long, I actually looked this up in the Smithsonian Magazine, an article on the Fox Sisters and the rap of spiritualism. I like to play on words, actually. But So this started, and actually I don't have it here, but it started actually as a joke because it was March 31st that evening. So what's after March 31st? Uh, April, April Fool's. Fool's. They started as a joke, and it works so well they ran with it. And later they actually exposed it. They said it was a fraud and they exposed how they actually did it. But nobody could catch them. There was, it was very impressive, right? And I have, I have to think that maybe Satan was there probably protecting them a little bit too. Just to perpetuate this myth. Um, so, uh, and it was wrapping, like I said, they would... So they would communicate, like, how old was the neighbor? And you'd hear 31 knocks for their age or things like that, right? And so today, I'm going to skip over the rest of that. Today, we have psychics, right, in the world. And they're pretty much accepted in the world as normal nowadays, right? This isn't the witch of Endor to where if you practice this, you're going to be killed. Um, have you ever, <coughs> I expect, just answer freely. Has anyone ever been to a psychic? I've been. Yeah. yeah. Did they tell you some truths? Yeah, it is true. Uh, before I came to America and I went to see my friend actually asked me to go. And it's it's our friend, co workers. And then I said, oh, yeah, you're going to have a family member pass away. It is true, my brother in law passed away. So let me say this though. 
I've met skeptics who say, no, it's not true. One of them was a guy who used to work with once upon a time who did a site, a website for the psychic. She told me things about my family nobody knows. Um, this other guy, um, your friend, or um, my wife's friend's boyfriend, basically went to prove him wrong, and they told him all these details about family members that nobody knew and things like that. So there is that element. Satan loves to give you a little truth, or a lot of truth even, mixed with lies, right, to bring you in, because he is a liar and a murderer from the beginning. Um, who do you think is feeding the psychics that information? Demons. Satan. Satan. I used to do things myself, or read tarot cards and stuff like that, and I would tell people things that they were like, how do you know this? Because well, you're told. <laughs> and they might not know everything like God does, but then do they know a lot about our lives? Yes. Do they watch us? You're observing all the time. Yep. Because they might not be able to read your mind, but they can pretty well tell what you're thinking just by looking at you. So... Um, Characters, near-death experience, since I'm almost out of time, we're going to run through this. There are, can you go to the next list? There we go. Near-death experiences. This is when somebody dies and they have a vision like they're going to heaven or hell and they go through a tunnel. They may recall separating from their body or viewing in real time as above. And the NDEs is based on the, the Sabbath school lesson for today. Um, they pass through a tunnel of light or enter, um, encounter deceased relatives or compassionate entities. They have a vast um, sense or that sense of vastness or deep insight. A lot of times it's a life-changing event for people. Um, they evaluate themselves not by their own standards, but by a universal <laughs> standard, and they usually have either a positive or a negative effect. And a lot of people say like they went to heaven or hell kind of thing. But science is starting to uncover NDEs and realize some things about it. 50% of the people they've interviewed actually have sleep or REM sleep intrusion, so that seems to be a factor in it. Um, the gamma waves, when they've done studies, um, seem to spike when oxygen is depleted from the brain for these individuals. There was a common belief once upon a time when your heart stops beating, your brain stops too, right? No, they're finding out about 40% of people that flatline when their heart stops beating, their brain is still active for a very long time afterwards. And so, and if you cut the oxygen off from that brain, it can go to some interesting places apparently. And if you've ever heard of a, um, a sensory deprivation tank where people go to release their anxiety and things like that, you're weightless because you're floating, it's dark, there's no sound. After a while, <coughs> you will actually, it's very relaxing at first, but if your brain is deprived from input for that long, your brain will start making things up. You will start hallucinating. You will start creating things to feed your brain. So um, really... And the best part I love from the article, they said, if you left your body and went somewhere else on this journey and came back, how do you have a memory of it? Does it the memory reside in your brain and your body? And the scientists are like, just that fact alone cast doubt, scientifically speaking, on the fact that you really didn't go anywhere and it was just all in your mind and the whole time. And I'm sure Satan helps facilitate some of this as well. So let's move to the last part with the memory verse. 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 through 17. There we go. Would someone like to read it? I can read it. <laughs> For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord. Thank you. This immortality is given by God. That is the immortality we will ever have in this life or any life above. Michelle, can you tell us about Sunday's lesson, the deadly consequences of spiritualism? Well, the deadly, deadly I'm going to try to move fast because <laughs> we've uh, taken a lot of time, but it was very interesting. I really don't know a lot of the things that you said because we, I don't spend time looking at that, I run away from it. And there's good reason to run away from it. 
So the deadly consequences of spiritualism. But my first question is, how did it all begin? You know, we've heard where it began, but with all that we've talked about, we may uh, kind of move away from that thought. It began in Genesis. It, it began with Satan. And we read the text um, that was in Genesis 3 with verse 4 and 5. And, you know, that the serpent told the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So the question is, uh, well, we know what happened. They died. <laughs> so, and we know it was a lie. And, um, but Satan was laying a foundation um, for the future with a plan to perpetuate the lie. So this was the beginning right. of it. So, you know, a lot of people might say, you know, you've had loved ones that, you know, people that have lost a loved one and when you're talking to them, sometimes you feel that it's not the right moment to tell them and it might not be the right moment to tell them when they say my loved one is in heaven or in a better place. Um, because, and, you know, someone might say, what does it matter? Uh, in the end, what does it matter if you believe this or that, you know, it's no consequence. But the reality is that we do make decisions based on what we believe. And I have a friend, a ER friend, physician, that, uh, in, from Illinois, that, you know, there were so many cases that really broke his heart um, of people that attempted suicide in the hope of dying and being reunited with a loved one in heaven. So we do make decisions wow. based on these things that we hear, and there is more. Whereas we're looking at this, we will see um, that's not, that's just one example. Um, it really affects us on a daily basis. <clears throat> It enslaves us to the wrong ideas, takes us in the wrong decision, even for some people to take their own life. Um, but Jesus said to us, and I'd like to look at the next text, John 8, verses 31 through 32. And if someone would leave that, read that, that'd be great. And you see the words in red. That's Jesus speaking to us. Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth shall make us free, and if we abide in his word, so that's our goal, to abide in his word, to know his word and abide in his word. So um, now Jesus gives us warnings of things that can happen. So let's read on to the next text. Move on to Matthew 10, verse 28. Um, and if someone would read, great. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. So Jesus is saying this to us, and he is lovingly giving us a warning and he's telling us what? What can, you know, what should this verse alone tell us about the supposed immortality of the soul? It can be killed. Who told us? And God. can be destroyed. And there is, you know, there, he's separating the two, says, do not fear those that kill the body. Like, who kills the body? I mean, uh, there's another human, human, another human being. Yeah, man. But who, who kills the soul? God. God. Well, God, but also Satan, when he gets us deceived and takes us, makes help, you know, it takes us in a direction that will move away from God and choose um, something other than God. And that has power. That one is Satan, and he has the power to destroy both soul and body if we allow him and if we follow oh, him. But I think well, the, cons yes. the, the, the kill the souls mean the consequences of your, of your deed. True. Right. And I would actually add to that, he puts you in a position in your relationship to God that puts you in a, in a place where you can't be with the Lord. And so he, he is, he, he's good at deceiving you into mm -hmm. putting you into a position where God has no choice later <laughs> when judgment actually occurs that you'll fall on the wrong side of it. Correct. So um, I'm thankful for your, in, you know, please feel free to contribute. Like if you have thoughts, just jump in, raise your hands, speak up. Um, as we talk about these things, um, 
God, as we are together and studying the word together, God impresses on us thoughts and um, it's, we learn by sharing with each other. So thank you. Right. Now, with the foundation thus laid by Satan um, for immortality of the soul, the door was opened to people trying to talk to those possibly dead and they believe, that they believed continued to live on in another dimension. That was the next text on the screen. I'm not going to always call for them, okay? Um, so does God have anything to say about that? You know, like immortality of the soul. Does, what, what did God tell us in his word? So did he give any instruction regarding talking to the dead? So I have three texts, um, or two texts, that we will read. And if someone would read Deuteronomy 18, verses 9 through 13, they will be up on the screen. Um, when you enter the land, Adonai, your God is giving you, you are not to learn how to follow the abominable practices of those nations. There must not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, a diviner, a soothsayer, an enchanter, a sorcerer, a spellcaster, consultant of hosts for spirits, or a necromancer. For whoever does those things is detestable to Adonai, and because of these abominations, <coughs> Adonai your God is driving them out ahead of you. You must be wholehearted with Adonai your God. Yeah. Well, that was pretty clear, and I've underlined as I was reading this text, God was so clear. These are abominations of those nations of uh, the nations when the children of Israel were supposed to come into the land um, they should not learn to follow the abominations of those nations and then he listed them clearly you know um, some of the practices that were in that day and some of them we recognize today um, makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire uh, or one who practices witchcraft. Witchcraft has become very popular <coughs> nowadays. Uh, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, <coughs> or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, uh, or one who calls up the dead. So he was very clear in, in the instruction. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. Not only are the deeds, the person, you know, it's going in that direction, and this is an abomination to the Lord, because the abominations, these have been, of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. So the Lord forbade um, his people from involvement in occultism of any kind. They were not to tolerate uh, among them a medium or a spiritist or one who calls up the dead. So the punishment uh, of driving them out, you, we'll see what was the punishment if there was such a person in their midst. And we should read for, uh, the next text, Leviticus 20, with verse 27. Um, a man or a woman who is a medium or who has familiar spirits shall surely be put to death. They shall stone them with stones. Their blood shall be upon them. Pretty serious. The punishment uh, is, seems incredibly harsh. But it was designated to protect Israel from worshiping false gods. Yes. Yeah. And that part with familiar spirits. So if it's a medium, somebody who talked to the dead or had familiar spirits, like basically evil spirits they, they communicated with and like were you know, associated or affiliated with them, either or. So if you're into anything like that, you're going to be stoned. <laughs> yeah. How about you consult with them? That would be consulting, yes. Yes. <laughs> That'll be consulted with them. So, but um, God was so clear. Now, um, why would God be so strong and so definite? And we could move on. I think uh, the next thing's on the screen. I don't know if we have them out. No, it isn't. Okay. Um, God um, would be, was so strong and so definite because um, witchcraft is demonic. Um, and it seduces people into false worship. I mean... If you've even seen it in movies, maybe you haven't practiced or participated in it, but if you even caught a glimpse of something of, in the movie, you know, what is it like? People um, go with respect and fear, you know, and listen and make life decisions on this. They're seduced and 
in, in believing that this higher power and they be, can't go to the point where they're really listening to everything they say, they're worshiping them, they're respecting them. You know, some people have in their homes even little things for the uh, dead or the spirits. So it is um, false worship. It seduces people into false worship and it counterfeits <coughs> a genuine relationship with God. Um, but it can never satisfy the deepest needs of the heart. Spiritualism is at the heart of Satan's plan to take the world captive, but Jesus, by his grace and power, sets us free, sets the captives free from the chains of evil that bind them. And um, it is our desire to turn, on to turn to God and to follow him. So as we go into the, uh, towards the end of Wednesday, Sunday's lesson, there's three more Bible texts that I'd like to go over and you know, think of what do these Bible passages teach us about death and about communication with the dead. And the first one is Ecclesiastes 9 with verse 5. So if someone would read. <coughs> For the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing, <coughs> and they have no more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. So, what are we seeing in this text? Very pointed. There's a whole lot of nothing in death. Yeah. The dead know nothing, the living know something, but the dead know nothing, um, and they have no more reward, and the memory of them is forgotten. How about our next text? Okay. Um, Job 7, verse, um, well, chapter, remember that my life is a breath, my eye will never again see good. The mm -hmm. eye of him who sees me will see me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall no longer be. As a cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. Mm. Well, pretty clear. Was Job um, wrong? No. 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 God had told them, and we've seen, you know, just a sampling of what God had told them about these things. Now, the last text, Isaiah 8, verses uh, 19 through 20. And when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, should not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? To the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So we definitely want to follow the light and we definitely want to go to the word because there are so many things we've seen a little bit, we understand a little bit, but God's protecting us from a lot. So we will Thank not be deceived if we're in the word. Excellent. Thank you, Michelle. Barbara. And it was very interesting as you were reading Genesis, right? I know that Genesis says, you know, the serpent is the one that interacted with Eve. But in reality, we know that it was a beautiful creature, right? Ellen oh, White reveals, you know, that to us, right? And if you look at it from that perspective, it's, it's like a Disney movie, mm -hmm. Right? And so if you read how it is, that's exactly how the Disney movies are. Over, obviously, it was more beautiful. But what are we teaching our children? And at that very young and impressionable age, no wonder there's so much in our culture today because we look at these things as if they're just like, oh, little kitty things, whatever. But we, we are paving the way for that. It's, mm -hmm. it's making a base and a foundation for yes. us. It is. It, is, it is hard to change the habit, the culture, I mean, culture, like we are going, we used to go to the graveyard so. and wash our face and believing that my mom will know it, that, you know, it's hard to change that. If I said it to my sister, I wouldn't fight. Yeah. Barbara, can you tell us about death in the Old Testament? <laughs> yes. <clears throat> so, um, as we get into this death in the Old Testament, I had a Jewish friend several years ago whose daughter had lost a loved one. I can't remember if it was a pet or a person, but anyway, she was struggling with the issue of death. And he didn't know what to tell her. And because he didn't know. 
So he, I told him I would do a Bible study with him. We did that Bible study out of the Old Testament only. And so the Old Testament will tell you exactly what you need to know about death. So let's jump in and look at some scriptures. Psalm 6, 5. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In the grave, who will give thanks? So we know that once you go to the grave, that you don't remember anything, and <clears throat> you, can't, you can't share. And we heard that with... Um, Ecclesiastes 9.5 that Michelle read, that the dead know nothing. So Psalms 115.17 said, what, says what? Who wants to read that really quick? The, the, dead, dead, go ahead. the dead do not praise the Lord, nor any the do go down into silence. Yeah. So once we're gone, do we praise God? Mm. Nope. No. I think that is very significant, and I, I'll tell you why it's very significant. Um, um, a little while before, we were saying that you're dead because you don't have the spirit. If you don't have the spirit, there's no relationship with God. Yeah. You just cannot praise God. Yeah. No, but there's really no relationship with anyone. Anyone, that's exactly anyone. right. 1 Kings 2.10 says what? Then David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. This issue of sleeping with your fathers, this issue of, of death being as, it categorized as a sleep. When you sleep, what happens? You don't know. Unless you're dreaming, you just go to sleep, and then what happens? You wake up, wake up, wake up. Yeah, it's the next morning. And hours go by between, don't they? Yeah. And so, go ahead. I was going to say, even if you've ever had a procedure or been put under by anesthesia, right? Three hours go by, and to you, it's just like, well, it's two seconds. <laughs> yeah. So the Bible uses this concept of sleep to explain the dead over and over and over again. In fact, we see... Uh, uh, in 1 Kings 11.43, we see Solomon slept with his fathers. In 1 Kings 14.20, we see Jeroboam ran 22 years, and he slept with his fathers. You will see this over and over and over. In fact, 36 times in the Old Testament, if you look up slept with fathers, 36 times in the Old Testament, the Bible connotates death as sleep. Um, in, in this, just, just slept with fathers. Just that, that, that tag. So um, we can see that um, that this concept of sleep and death go hand in hand. Let's look at Psalms uh, thirteen three. Somebody like to read that for me? Consider and hear me, O Lord, my God, enlighten, enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. So we see that the Bible understands the difference between sleeping and the sleep of death. So, I, 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 I think, are we getting a picture that the Old Testament's pretty clear on this? Uh, Psalms 95. You carry them away like a flood. They are like a sleep. In the morning, they are like grass which grows up. So it's this laying down the and getting up. We see it over and over and over again. Job 14, 12 says, At your rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and the horse were cast into what? Oh. Uh -oh. Yeah. Roused from their sleep. So, <clears throat> I, I have a different version in my, it's, it's anyway, the, the dead, dead sleep. So we look at that. Psalms 17:15. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied when I wake up in your likeness. Mm -hmm. And a glorified body. And a glorified Amen. Body. So we see that, don't we see that in Revelation? Yeah. That the dead will rise. And God will put on a new body and, we'll, and, and all of that. This has been understood throughout time. 
So, so this concept is not new. <clears throat> um, let's talk. Of, let's look at, at Psalms seventy six six in this in in this version, um, CJB version. The bravest have been stripped of their spoil and are now sleeping their final sleep. Um, so um, the great controversy here says, a failure to understand the truth about death leaves us open to deceptions of Satan. Many will be confronted by the spirits of devils personating beloved relatives and declaring the most dangerous heresies. And we know that that is happening today. Mm -hmm. um, when we've done revelation seminars, we've had many people who have, have stopped talking to their dead loved ones because they realize it's not their loved ones that they're talking to. These visitants will appeal to our tenderest sympathies and will work miracles to sustain their pretensions. We must be prepared to to withstand them with Bible truth that the dead know not anything and that they, those who appear, are spirits of devils. <laughs> Daniel 2, we see here, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to everlasting contempt. So we'll, we'll all get to wake again. <laughs> We just want to be, huh? Some more than once. Some more than once, yes. <laughs> For a select few. <laughs> For a select few. I think that's going to be a big selection, though. I think that's not going to be a few. I think it's going to be more than a few that are that, that wait to see Christ come again. Um, let's take a look at Job uh, 19, 25, and 26. Somebody want to read that? Sure. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at the last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Even Job knew about the resurrection. It, it's, really, it's really clear. Go ahead, Daniel. In the, the Roman the catacombs, in the sections where the Christians are buried, they were buried together, and the, some of them had writings that they would see each other at the resurrection. So they, obviously in the early church, it was quite well known, it, this device of the, you go up to heaven had not happened yet. It only came after Constantine and the changes that the, they were instituted. Mm -hmm. The early Christians knew, just like Job, exactly what would happen. And, yeah. and, and Barbara, I think we need to make it quite clear that death is asleep for all, all. Yes. And there will be a time when everyone will be resurrected. Yeah. Some at uh, Jesus' coming, some after the millennium. Mm -hmm. But they will all be resurrected from the sleep. Yeah. Yes. It will, it, it, the, yes. That doesn't mean we don't mourn the dead. That's exactly. Because we miss. And that's even in Revelation after the second death. It says God will wipe away every tear That's right. it. because you will see all these people that come to nothing ultimately forever. That's exactly. It's your, more than likely if you're in the city in New Jerusalem, you're going to know somebody out there. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to finish with the Great Controversy, page 549. This is a little bit longer one, but <clears throat> nowhere in the sacred scripture is found the statement that the righteous go to their reward or the wicked go to their punishment at death. So it's just not in scripture. The patriarchs and prophets have left no such assurance. Christ and his apostles have given no hint of it. The Bible clearly teaches that the dead do not go immediately to heaven. They are represented as sleeping until the resurrection. In the very day when sil the silver cord is loose and the golden bowl broken, man's thoughts perish. They go down to the grave in silence. They know no more of anything that is done under the sun. Bless blessed rest for the weary righteous. Time be it long or short, 
it is but a moment to them. They sleep, they are awakened by the trump of God to a glorious immortality. As they are called forth from their deep slumber, they begin to think just where they ceased. The last sensation was the pang of death, the last thought that they were falling beneath the power of the grave. When they arise from the tomb, their first glad thought be echoed in the triumphal shout, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Thank you. So now we're going to move to Tuesday, <laughs> death in the New Testament. And, and I looked at this and I said, well, we already talked about death in the Old Testament. Things haven't changed. But, um, but so we're, we're going to, first of all, just establish once again what we already know. So as we can see, sleep is still equated to death in both the Old and the New Testament. But have you ever heard someone say that um, after Jesus was crucified and resurrected, that that changed? I'm going to debunk some popular Christian myths today. So, um, so we know this in Acts 2. So we're going to refer to some things after Jesus died and was resurrected. Acts 2.29 Brethren, I may confidently say to you regarding the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. So even after Christ resurrected to heaven, where was David? Sleeping in a tomb, um, decayed and probably not looking the best, but you know. Um, and Acts 13.35, David wrote this, right? The one who was sleeping. Therefore, he also says to another, or, or in another psalm, you will not allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Who's he talking about? Jesus, the only one who wasn't sleeping who died. <laughs> so, and I mean, we know that Moses is in heaven and he passed away. Um, we know Elijah was taken while he was still alive. And we know Enoch is there because the Lord took him while he was alive. And we know there was the first fruit that God took with him. Um, after the resurrection, when the tombs were open, it describes in Matthew. But outside of that, nobody is living forever. So, what else does the New Testament say about sleep, death, and eternal life? Well, let's go to John 11, verses 11 through 14. Would someone like to read that? This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go so that I may awaken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he was speaking of literal sleep. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. It couldn't be more clear. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure this out. He, he's not saying he's, he's up in heaven or he's right. on the way to heaven or, you know, he's not saying anything. He, he is dead, right. And so then actually, but did they know about the resurrection? And that's where we're going to look at John 11, 21 through 26. Would someone like to read that? Hello. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on that last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? So, and when I say it will never die, that's that eternal death. Um, so bottom line, they even knew about the resurrection, right? They knew about the second coming of the Lord while Jesus was on this earth. So it was pretty clear at that point in time. And then also if we read, I'll go ahead and read this, 1 Corinthians 15, 51 through 54. That that conversion to immortality, when does it actually occur? Behold, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will uh, all be changed. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we will be changed. For this perishable must put on the imperishable and this mortal must put on immortality. But when the perishable will put on the, in, on the imperishable and the mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying <coughs> that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. So that is the only time immortality 
will ever come to us as at the second coming of Christ. And if you've fallen asleep in Christ or you're part of that last remnant on this earth. And that's it. And who gives you that immortality? The only immortal one. God, yes. So it's pretty clear. There is no immortal soul. It's missing from any, everywhere. So now let's go into some of the myths. And I looked up the, the stuff online. So let's go debunking a few myths here. Luke 23, 43. The, the claim is the promise of Jesus that the thief who repented, the thief on the cross, right? would be in paradise with him that day. People use this all the time to say he went straight to heaven, right? And where you put the comma, <clears throat> oh, I didn't get both of them. So it says, truly I, and he said to him, truly I say to you, yes. comma, today you shall be with me in paradise. You know there's no comma in the original Greek, right? right. Or you can say, truly I say to you today, comma, you will be with me in paradise, which is the but <clears throat> I'm telling you, either way you spin it, it doesn't pan out. Did Jesus go to heaven on that Friday when he was crucified? No. What did he do? Yes. And Matthew says it best, Matthew 12, 39 through 40. Let scripture discern scripture. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign. And yet no sign will be given to you but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For as Jonah, or for just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He didn't go to heaven. How could he have possibly take met the, the thief if he went straight to heaven? It does not compute, right? Impossible. The second myth I want to debunk is about this is about us going straight to heaven when we die is 2 Corinthians 5 8. Now Paul is in the commentary said Paul well and then this is a born again person commenting on this. Paul clearly says that to be absent from the body i.e. death means being present with the Lord. And so we're going to read 2 Corinthians 5 8. Where of good courage I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body and to be at home with the Lord. So you they'll take that as saying, well, you're in heaven with God. Yes. But if you look at 2 Corinthians 5, 8, it says, I'm sorry, um, 2 Timothy um, 4, 6 through 8. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So what is Paul really saying? What's, what's that day? Second coming. Second coming. And not only for him, but for all, right? So how could Paul say that he's going to be in heaven with Jesus? When he died, if he actually says something completely different, did Paul get confused? He doesn't say he's going to be in heaven with Jesus. When no, he but that's the interpretation that people are trying to spin yeah, on. But, but he, he goes to the grave and his mind knows nothing. The next right. just thought he has is seeing Jesus come. So that's why he can say that. And, exactly. And so, but uh, these are all the things that people try to use in Scripture to justify that you go straight to heaven or hell when you die. And um, Philippians, um, Philippians 1.23, they'll try to say that Paul desired to depart from this life to be, um, to be with Christ in heaven. And once again, and the verse reads, but I'm hard pressed from both directions, having the desire to depart and be with Christ for that is much better. Because did Paul have an easy life? No, no. very difficult life. He was stoned to death, at least in Greek it says to death. I'm guessing that God revived him. Um, once, he's beaten many times. He spent time in prison. He knows coldness and hunger and all these things. But um, even to be with God, if you look at John 12, 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. 
Does that make sense that we can be with God right here, with Jesus right here and now? Um, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And the, oh God, I have some time left. We read Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through um, 17. But one of the other things that people will say, and this is a belief that you may have heard or not. At the second coming, have you ever heard people say that Jesus brings all the souls with him that are in heaven? Yeah, but there's no text in the Bible that but, says that. Uh, and, and I will tell you, my mother was Catholic. She got some truth. But when we had her funeral, she went in a Catholic church. If you say you died and went straight to heaven, they're okay with that. If you say they'll be resurrected at the second coming, they're okay with that. And I'm like, how? <laughs> and so apparently the belief that's going out there is that Jesus brings all the souls from heaven with him to a habit, new resurrected bodies that he will re recreate at the second coming. That, that is the belief of, of most of the mainstream Christian church right. today. Yeah. And, uh, you, you can't understand that once you <clears throat> adopt the thought that you never die, then you've got to look for a reconciliation of well, a yeah. body that is on, on the ground and quote unquote a soul. That right. Is, but what do sorry. they do with all the, the souls that are going to heaven? Then, do they just float around the earth? Well, they, they, that doesn't matter because they're not going to heaven. So we just neglect that part. So, <laughs> but, and so, and verse 14 is what they focus on. So I'll read 13 and 14. We know the rest of it. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brethren, about those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve as do the rest who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. And they will say that verse right there is Jesus brings all those souls with them. Now, if they've fallen asleep, we already know what that means in the Bible. They're dead and they know nothing. And so, you know, I'll skip past that one since my time is rapidly fading. Revelation 6 through 9, they will use... Do you remember the, um, the fifth seal when Christ breaks it and the souls that are under the altar? Yes. Well, those are people living in heaven. Does God keep them in a little trap door room under the altar in heaven? And like, you can't come out until the second coming. You stay there. No, it's symbolism. Revelation is heavily symbolic. And there is no, no room with a crawl space underneath the throne where God puts all the souls that have not perished yet. And a lot of times I would refer to um, Revelation 7, 19 through 14 as well um, about the great multitude that's in heaven. But that's the remnant, and that's 144,000. And the last one that I got from a Catholic website was about um, the rich man and Lazarus. So we know the story. It's very long. I don't have time to read it. The rich man is eating. He has a great life. Lazarus is a poor man outside the gate. They both perish. The dog licks his sores, etc. They both perish. And where does Lazarus, the poor man, go? Yeah. In the bosom of Abraham. Bosom of Abraham. Whereas the rich man is over being tortured and, um, and the other side. And it sounds very Greek, doesn't it, with the underworld? And they'll say that that is proof that there is life after you die. And that the soul goes somewhere. And any Jew that Jesus told this to knows that that is a parable. It's pure fiction. <laughs> and the last verse about this in the parable is really about, but he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. It's really about them believing in Jesus. So... People are trying to get the Bible to validate a fairy tale that they conjured, that's been conjured by the devil. And ever since he convinced Eve of it back in the garden, what is our true hope? Our true hope is to either die or fall asleep in Christ or be that remnant at the end and meet the Lord in the air when he comes. Because if we're not focused on the resurrection and what God wants us to do in this life, we won't know that life ever, and we will literally come to nothing, and ultimately nothing for all eternity. Michelle, yeah. spiritualism in the last days, part one. Okay, part one. Uh, you know, I, I can't help but think of 
people that I encounter every day and, you know, people that God cares about, um, people that we get to care about, um, and they have been fooled in believing all these things. And, you know, if you try to share with them, um, it's painful because that's a very painful spot where they're in you know, with the loss of a loved one and the belief they have that they continue living on. They do not know because we have spent a lot of time in the Word and we're learning about what God tells us um, to protect us. But people are deceived and, you know, by things that they have heard for many years, for many, many years, for maybe most of their lives. And as we read in the beginning when we started our lesson that Satan laid the foundation early on and he is continuing uh, promoting this lie, and people have fallen into this deception. Oh. But there's all kinds of deceptions, yes. I think what you're trying to say also, it's very hard to unlearn what you've learned yes. for so long. Yes, yeah. And, you know, especially if you found comfort, some people find comfort in this. Yeah. But, so, this is a deception, but it, you know, the question becomes, okay, spiritualism in the last days, which is our day and time and age. So, uh, what kind of deceptions will we face? This is one of them, but you know, what's gonna be, what do we need to look out for? And there's uh, three texts that I'd like to highlight. And one, the first one is Matthew 24, uh, in verses five, there, it'll be verse 11 and verse 24, in uh, Matthew 24, chapter 24. So if someone would read, and let's pay attention to what, we are being told here. Now, uh, these are the words of Jesus as well. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive the possible even the elect. So, what it will look like in our day, what are we seeing? We're seeing deceptions. Deceptions. Falsehoods, yeah. false, um, teachings, false, false teachings, teachings. Mm -hmm. and they're doing, they're misleading, yes. and they're leading in the wrong direction. Um, another text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. If someone would read that. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now is trained will do so until it's taken out of the way. And then the law was one who will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the work of Satan, with all power, signs, and law and wonders. So, what did we hear? We, we heard the word lawlessness and lawless one and lawless uh, several times as we were going through this text. And, you know, um, the law is needs to be done is done away with and we do not need any any direction from god that tells us how to live our lives we like to live our lives our own way uh, please don't tell, talk to me about the law you're a legalist um, but why is the law in place for our protection you know um, and for the protection of people in general but not only people us so we see they're just talking about apostasy and lawlessness and power, uh, coming with power, working of Satan, uh, with power, signs, and lying wonders. So they're not true miracles of God, they're lying wonders. Um, how about the, another text? Revelation 13 was verse 13. Someone read? He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. So again, great signs, even something like fire. And, you know, I don't have verse 14 on the screen, but it continues to say that great signs would be used to deceive those that dwell on the earth. So that's the purpose of these great signs and these miracles that are performed. So I have a quote that was in our um, lesson study, and it is from um, uh, Angel Manuel Rodriguez, or Angel Manuel Rodriguez, uh, who is a Seventh-day Adventist theologian who was the director of the Biblical Research Institute before his retirement. 
and his special research interests included Old Testament sanctuary and atonement in Old Testament theology. He has written several books and authors a monthly column in the Adventist world. He has spent a lot of time in the Word. And so commenting on the deceptive power of uh, demonic spirits, An Angel Rodriguez talks about the persuasive power of <clears throat> miraculous manifestations in the form of signs and wonders and makes this telling um, statement. As the cosmic conflict approaches its closure. Demonic power will enter the arena of human history in an unprecedented way. <clears throat> Spiritualism, whose very foundation is the non-biblical teaching of the immortality of the soul, will nearly take the world captive. So, you know, shall we trust what we see? Shall we trust what we hear? We're learning to not even, you know, not to trust the internet and um, even if someone is very determined telling us something is a certain way, we look at the Word of God. Yeah, but seeing is believing, right? Well, that's uh, what most people think. Yeah, I think we should talk about that. Uh, should we trust our emotions? Mm. Should we trust our senses? Um, you know, like if you think about, uh, I don't remember what it's called right now, the word is escaping me, <laughs> how uh, you can now see Elvis Presley performing live even though he's dead. AI. 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 Not AI, it's... Impersonators? It, it, no, no, it's a... Um, hologram. Hologram, that's the word, hologram. hologram. I couldn't remember the word. So, you know, they use all kinds of things. Satan, you know, he's been around for a long time, so maybe these things are new for us, but they're not new for him. Well, even in Job, the devil makes fire come down from heaven. That wasn't God that had caused the fire yeah. to come down, so it's not like he hasn't done it before, and he's going to have even better stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, um, shall we trust what we hear, what we see, or shall we trust the Word of God? And we are talking about the Word of God here and reading from the Word of God to know what God is telling us. So, shall we trust our emotions? You know, the question would be, so, uh, what role do they play, good and bad, in our faith experience? Um, could Satan bypass our thinking processes and appeal to our feelings? Um, now, I don't know if I have this on the text or not, uh, on the screen, um, a quote from The Great Controversy? Yes, we do. So, someone could read it or I could read it? Okay. Satan has long been preparing for his final effort to deceive the world. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time, except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept away, swept into the ranks of this delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. So, um, as I'm approaching the end of this section, you know, the question is, how can we be safe? Can we trust our emotions? You know, no, they can deceive us. And, you know, Satan works with fear. Um, and you, we forget that. When things are happening in our lives and we start being fearful, we do not realize that we're told in the Word of God that those are the attacks of Satan, those are the darts of the enemy. So, um, yes, I see a hand going up. Yeah, I was gonna say that about the emotions, you know, trust our emotions. That's why Jesus teaches us when he was in this earth, be prayerful. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit guide him the same way the Holy Spirit yeah. will guide us if we are prayerful and we are connected to God. Correct, and as you're saying that, I'm remembering there's a text in the Bible that tells us that God has given, not given us a spirit of fear, of one of power and a sound mind. And he has given us the word in the uh, Old Testament, uh, all the writings in the New Testament that is grounding us in the assurance that God is our creator, he cares about us, he can protect us, we can call on him, and we need to depend on him. Um, our only safeguard um, against Satan's last day delusions is a personal relationship with Christ and a solid grounding in the teachings of the Bible. Um, this includes uh, its teaching about death, regardless of what 
our eyes and ears and hearts might try to tell us. So we've just talked about spiritualism in the last day, part one. Uh, can you continue with part two? Yeah, yeah, but I was gonna say this also, it is good that we share, because I know Eva mentioned it earlier, mm -hmm. um, if somebody goes to the grave to visit their relatives or whatever, they, uh, you can go as a memory to remember them, but if you start talking to them, they're not there, but we would have to pray for the wisdom and discernment on how to say these things that God can give you the words. Because, I mean, I, even my neighbor talked about her son who committed suicide, and she goes, I know he's in heaven right now, and I'm like, shut up, Byron. <laughs> Because now is not the time to even talk about this. So, but for God to give us that grace and wisdom to do it. Yeah, you know, it, it's interesting when we're talking about spiritualism in the, the last days. Like, in secular society and even in churches, we're seeing creeping in, you know, teachings that are around experience and emotions and all that kind of stuff. It's just preparing for this great deception. Like, if people aren't just focused on the Word of God and saturating your mind with the Word of God and understanding from, from that perspective, all these other kind of methods <coughs> of being, you know, church or theology, they're not appropriate, right? That's right. leading towards that great deception. And I'll say I'm not articulating that well, but I have a concern mm -hmm. over how these kind of practices are creeping into the church. Yeah, and you think about it, if we let our emotions drive us, Christ is our example, right? Yeah. If Jesus would have let his, his emotions drive him, he would have said, let this cup pass from me. Yeah, right. And we'd all be out of luck. But he said, not my will, but your will, right. the will of the Father be done. Mm -hmm. In our lives, we have to trust God, that he knows what he's doing, and not rely on our senses, because we can be deceived. Yeah. And also, Satan is the original liar. Also, we have to, like what Alicia said, Cross check with the Bible. Is that our emotions connected, related with the Bible? Is it correct according to the Bible? Well, if I, I think emotion is more like our personal things. That's why we God encourages be prayerful and connected with me. The Holy Spirit and angel will guide us. Barbara, spiritualism in the last days, part two. I'm going to take us to a whole new level. Oh <laughs> boy! <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So. We know that in this last day, our only hope is who? Jesus. The only thing we can trust is what? God and his word. The Bible. That's right. That's right. So Titus 2.13 says, Looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So Satan's goal is to destroy our hope, isn't it? And to... to um, to, to have us give up because as he gets a, as we get closer and we are getting closer every day to this this coming about we see that he, we're going to see we're going to see more signs and wonders we see them now we see them now but they're they're going to get even more revelation 14 12 says here are the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. So our only hope is to hang on to Christ as we go through this. And I want to I wanna start with that and I want to end with that. Because we need to be keeping the commandments and we need to have the faith of Jesus. That means we need to have the same faith that Christ had. And... And so that faith we need to continue to work on. Um, I want to jump, though, now to the things that are going to be happening in, in, at the end. Would somebody read for me Matthew 24, 23 through 27? Then, then if anyone say to you, look here, is a Christ, or there do not believe it, for false Christ, Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to the side, if possible even the effect. See, I have told you this before hands. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, no go out. Or look, 
these in the inner rooms do not believe it. For us, the lightning come from the east and flash it to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. And, and we're going to come back and walk through this, but I want you to read two, two more scriptures and then we'll come back and, and walk through these. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13, and 14. <coughs> For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transformed himself into an angel of light. And then Thessalonians. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion, that they should believe the lie, mm -hmm. that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a lot of components to this. Satan doesn't just come at us from one direction, does he? So we see here, there's going to be false what? Prophets. There's going to be false prophets. There's going to be signs and wonders. And all of this is going to come together at the same time. What do we think about when we think about a false prophet? What do we think about? Telling what? lies. Telling lies? representing to be connected to God and know what's going to be happening, but they don't. Mm -hmm. And it's not truth. And they, they have to be a prophet, they have some sort of authority. That people listen to them. Yeah. There's, there's one more thing that I'm looking for that I'm not hearing. Hmm? They have a message. Thank you. They have a message. <coughs> they have a message, don't they? How, what did the prophets, what did many of, not all prophets, but what did many of the prophets do besides what was going on? Didn't they write? Yes. Yeah. Didn't they write down what they were told from yes. God? Mm -hmm. yes. So wouldn't these false prophets be writing down what they hear from Satan? Oh, yeah. Would you like to hear the agenda of one such? Yeah. Go ahead. I was, I was going to say, Barbara, I, I'm glad that you, you're addressing the issue because for me personally, a false prophet is just deception, period. You, 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 you can be a false prophet without believing in a religion, period. A false prophet is deception. And what the devil has been so good at doing is confusing those that have never decided to embrace God's word and follow it totally. And if you don't do that, if God's word is not the light, if God's word is not the beacon, if God's word is not the pathway that I follow, then everything else is deception and every other theory out there is a false prophet's theory. And you can easily be deceived because you don't right. have the guiding light of the word. Right. And the more there is of deception, the greater is the confusion that we find ourselves in it. Well, I, I, I can agree with you to a point on this, but I do want to say we only have two choices. Yeah. We have Christ and what the Bible says and everything else. That's correct. That's what I'm saying. Yeah, that's, that's, that's right. okay. That's what you're saying. Exactly. So anyway... <clears throat> Um, I just wanted to share with you really, really quickly. One of these, one of these false prophets who's written profusely, um, very well studied in all the esoteric things that are going on. Um, this person's name is Alice A. Bailey. Have any of you ever heard of Alice A. Bailey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alice A. Bailey. And there's a pit, uh, there's a picture. Can you go to that picture? Yeah. There's an a, a agenda yeah, that's right. that they have that that she has put together. Is the world following this agenda? That's my question. Yes. 
First one. So it's take God and prayer out of the schools, out of the education system. Right. That happened when? Back in 1980, didn't it? Right. Correct. So that's happened a while ago. Reduce parental authority over children. Right. Is that happening? Yes. Destroy Judeo-Christian structure or traditional <laughs> Christian family structure. Yep. 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 Um, has, has the sexual revolution happened? <laughs> yes. Is it, do we make abortion easy? Did we make divorce easy? Homosexuality, is that an alternative lifestyle now? Um, uh, debase art. How many, how many sculptures have we seen pulled down lately? Use media to promote and change the mindset. Create an interfaith movement. Is that happening? Yes. And get government to make all these laws and get the church to endorse the changes. So we're seeing this whole agenda being played out now. And so I just wanted us to realize, if we haven't figured it out already, this movement is well on its way to completion. So we see that. And as this, as this agenda gets more and more complete, Satan, we're going to see Satan getting stronger and stronger in his delusions and his deceptions. Hmm. And so, don't forget the winds of strife as they're restrained less and less. Yes. He gets more power. Yes, mm -hmm. he does get more power. I think Satan's goal is to destroy our hope in Christ. And he uses all this, including media, to promote the, you know, the mindset of change. Yeah. yeah. It's very popular right now. Yeah. So I, I wanted <clears throat> to uh, share a couple of quotes with you um, from Ellen White. And the final one is the good news. But in the last moments of time, Satan will enact his final deception. Fearful sights, a supernatural character will soon reveal, be revealed in the heavens. In token of the power of miracle working demons, the spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and to the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them to unite with Satan in the last struggle against government, the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects alike will be deceived. We're seeing so much deception right now in this world. So much, and especially in government and rulers, we're seeing a lot of deception. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and while claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's redeemer, they will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of scriptures. We're seeing that right now every day. There are, there are false Christs walking this earth. There are false, pro there, you've got faith healers healing people. You've got all kinds of things going on. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. And the church has long professed to look to the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself uh, among men as a majestic, dazzling brightness. However, um, con great controversy says in page 625, and I wanted to, s to share this with you because we kind of got off track uh, with this last week. Satan is not permitted, I want you to remember this, this is important, Satan has not, is not permitted to counterfeit, counterfeit the manner of Christ's coming, Absolutely. of his advent. Absolutely. Because that, that was discussed a little bit last week, and and um, and I found this scripture, God sent this scripture, or this, this quote, not scripture, this, this quote right after that. The Savior has warned his people against deception upon this point. He has clearly foretold the manner of his coming. 
For as lightning cometh out of the east and shineth to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. This coming is no more possible of counterfeiting. It will be universally known and witnessed to the whole world. So Satan is not allowed to... Satan will touch the earth. Huh? He's not allowed to hover above the earth. He's not allowed to hover above the earth. He has to touch the earth. And we, we, we had that conversation last week, and I didn't have an answer last week. But I had to bring it back this week because... God gave us an answer this week. But the good news is, in the desire of ages, the voice that cried on the cross, it is finished, is heard among the dead, it pierced the walls of the sepulchers and summoned the sleepers to rise. Thus it will be uh, when the voice of Christ is heard from heaven. The voice will, be, will penetrate the graves and unbar the tombs, and the dead in Christ shall arise. At the Savior's resurrection, Few graves were open, but at the second coming, all the precious dead shall hear the voice and shall come forth. As the soul lies open to the first Thessalonians 4, 13, 18, total complete. Mm -hmm. right. Amen. <clears throat> all righty. Final thoughts. I want to read um, Ellen White from The Great Controversy, page 552 and 553. It's up there, yeah. He has power to bring before men the appearance of their departed friends. The counterfeit is perfect. The familiar look, the words, the tone are reproduced with marvelous distinctness. Many are, com are comforted with the assurance that their loved ones are enjoying the bliss of heaven and without suspicion of danger they give ear to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. When they have been led to believe that the dead actually return to communicate with them, Satan causes those to appear who went into the grave unprepared. They claim to be happy in heaven and even to occupy exalted positions there. And thus the error is widely taught that no difference is made between the righteous and the wicked. Now, have you ever heard Christians talk about everyone goes to heaven eventually? Yeah. That would be this. Um, the pretended visitants um, from the world of spirits sometimes utter cautions and warnings which prove to be correct. Then as confidence is gained, they present doctrines that directly undermine faith in the scriptures with an appearance of deep interest in the well-being of their friends on earth. They insinuate the most dangerous errors. The fact that they state some truths and are able at times to foretell future events, gives to their statements the, an appearance of reliability. Let me pause there for a moment. That they at times are able to foretell events, right? The future. Who's the only one who knows the future from start to end? God. But Satan can get, get some pretty good guesses in there, right? Based on things he knows and probably a little influence as well. Um... And their false teachings are accepted by the multitude as readily and believed as implicitly as if they were the most sacred truths of the Bible. The law of God is set aside, the spirit of grace despised, and the blood of the covenant counted an unholy thing. The spirits deny the deity of Christ and place even the Creator on the same level with themselves. Thus, under the new disguise, the great rebel still carries on his warfare against God, begun in heaven and for nearly 6,000 years continued upon the earth. That's from the great controversy. But I'm going to tell you, if you don't know your Bible, if you don't know what truth is, if you don't have the Holy Spirit to guide you in those gray areas, any one of us will fall. If it's not this, it'll be something else. Mm -hmm. If you don't trust God implicitly at the end, and His Word, not as somebody interprets it, but as Scripture interprets it, as the Holy Spirit interprets the Bible, we're, we're heading toward the barbecue. <laughs> the second death with fire. I, I think it's important to remember that God gives us all those gifts. Yeah. We, we cannot attain those on our own. Right? The only thing we can do is humbly 
we submit ourselves to God and ask for those things. And he gives us those gifts. Amen. Even when it said, Barbara read earlier, you have the faith of Jesus, right? You can only have the faith of Jesus by having Christ dwelling in you. That's right. Because otherwise we are incapable. So, and as I said earlier, seeing is believing, right? No. Have you ever had an illusionist pull a trick on you? And I saw it, I believe it, right? And yet it's sleight of hand. If men can do that, what do you think Satan can do? So, and yet it's permeated into our culture. <laughs> Movies. You ever remember the movie Ghost? When Patrick um, Swayze and Demi Moore, and he comes back for the love of his life, the sixth sense, I see dead people all the time. Um, oh, let's go. Casper. Come on, everybody loves Casper. <laughs> Ghostbusters, that's so funny, right? The first, second, third, or eighth one, I'm not sure. Um, even in cartoons, as I'm a child, you have all this stuff. It's interwoven into the fabric of our very thought. The thing is, if we believe in, uh, you know, he's real, he will reveal to us. I mean, like, Satan will show it. Like, if we believe in his spirit, you know, like, it's happening in our house. The TV is on without we're having the remote control. Yeah, and then you turn it off and it comes back on again. It's like, all right, I get it. And then you unplug it. Now, if it came on when I unplugged it, then I might leave, but... <laughs> <laughs> so, but you know what? It, it's, it's all around us, and it's considered normal. And so when the time for that deception happens, most people won't think anything of it. Um, in the end days, the source will be no different than the witch of Endor, calling up that demon pretending to be Samuel, right? And the source is the same. Any form of spiritualism in our lives is a foothold for the enemy of God to access our lives, to inject false doctrine and ideas into our mind, and to treat something that God clearly abhors as a normal part of our lives every day. In the end lesson, I'll wrap it up with this. On Friday, it talks about the little girl that had the near-death experience and met her brother and all that. Um, and people hear it, it pulls at your emotions, Oh, she met her brother. She never knew. But it's a deception. And if you think that's good, it's going to get so much better at the end. So where Satan's been doing this for so long, he's honed his skill rather well. Don't be fooled. And the first steps down the path of false teaching, that is the first step in, in the path of false teaching that leads you to that ultimate death. The only immortality we will ever have is through Christ. Raising us from the dead, or if we see him coming in the clouds, and you're part of that last remnant, that 144,000, anything else is pure fiction. So on that note, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you with humble hearts. We come to you as a people in need. Amen. Lord, what do we really know? We think we're smart. But compared to the enemies that have rallied against you, we look to Solomon, the wisest man, and yet he's taking foreign wives and sacrificing children. The wisdom of man is nothing in the battle that we're engaged in. We pray, Lord, that your word, your spirit, dwell in our hearts and our minds, Amen. that we might have the discernment of the living God to know right from wrong, that we keep ourselves anchored to the throne of grace your mercy your love and your truth lord to know truth from error and to tactfully in a christ-like way share it with others so that they might accept and embrace your truth as well lord we could never do this alone we pray not only for those here in this room but anyone that watches this video lord that you give them the discernment that your holy spirit dwell and abide in them and lord that you reveal your truths so that lord in the end days when satan does his most marvelous deceptions you have a people anchored in your truth who stand firm for christ for the gospel and for your truly your character lord and your law. 
We thank you for the mercy you give us. We thank you for the patience you have with us, Lord. And we pray that you transform every heart and mind, not into what we are now, but to what you want us to be, to represent you on this earth as ambassadors to Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for everything. And Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, all you've done and all you will do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Um, don't forget the offering plate in the back as well for Sabbath school.